Hello CEP 200 students and welcome to unit 3 of the course. <clears throat> this video is to again talk about some things as well as to talk a little bit about the materials that you're going to come across in unit 3 and the type of information that we're going to be talking about in unit 3. So I know that I have made a couple of announcements since I began grading, let's see. So probably right after, right around February 27th and thereafter, I know that February 27th was when I made that post in substitution um, of the unit video. So I apologize for not recording a video, but things have been a little hectic. So I see that I made a post on March 3rd and March 8th. So I'm having some concerns, as I had mentioned in my post that I made last night, with assignments. So as a student in an online course, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are looking through the syllabus, that you are looking through the tracking calendar, and that you understand all of the expectations for the assignments. So in my welcome video, I went through and talked about what I was expecting from all of the assignments. So. If you're someone who you don't really, um, you know, process all of the information just by reading it, which is totally okay, um, and you prefer to watch it or hear someone telling you the information, that is why I make the unit videos. And also because sometimes just having the text and the syllabus and in the announcements isn't enough. So I actually prefer to make these videos and to explain everything to you. But with that being said, I need to make sure that students are watching the videos. It wasn't until last semester that I really had to turn on tracking for the unit videos and to really see who is and who isn't watching them. As they are part of the course, they are an element of the course that is required in each unit. I will start to notice and take count of who is watching the videos and who is not. So I am going to be turning on tracking for the videos. The reason I say that is because in the welcome video, I talk about the discussion board posts. It is said very clearly in the welcome video that you must comment on two of your classmates' posts, and this is also stated very clearly in the syllabus. While I understand that most of the class has done a really good job at commenting on two of their classmates' posts, there have been a handful of students who have not. And I did receive an email or two where students indicated that because it wasn't listed in the tracking calendar that they have to comment on two of their classmates posts where it says the discussion board that they didn't feel that it was explained well enough. My response to that, please make sure you're watching the videos. Um, this is where everything is being explained and if I notice that you are not watching the videos based on something that you mentioned in your assignment or um, getting an email, you will be docked points for that assignment. Um, it hasn't always been like this, but I am noticing that it's really becoming an issue. So you really need to make sure that you're watching these videos. But for those students who have been doing really well, uh, keep it up. It's great. Um, I can appreciate that you are doing everything that is required of the course. And generally, generally, if you continue doing what's expected and you are providing, you know, really in-depth, detailed, insightful responses in your unit assignments, and you're doing well on everything else, you really shouldn't have a problem passing this course. Um, but that is another thing that I did no notice yesterday while I was finishing up grading the last of the assignments. So with the 20 assignments that I graded yesterday, these would have been the um, last 20 assignments that students submitted for that assignment from the course. So I don't know if these students had happened to procrastinate or what that looked like, um, but the last 20 assignments like really were not that great. So for those who took the time to, you know, meet the requirements, provide insightful and detailed responses in the unit assignment, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. If you did not, you will notice that you got docked points. I would like to say that I was a bit more generous with grading this unit assignment. So if you continue to provide like short and non-descriptive responses, then you're probably going to see a, a larger point deduction in the future uh, unit assignments. So please, please just keep that in mind. So 
for unit two, let's take a look back at what you went through. So we talked about trauma-informed care and you learned about clinical mental health counselors and addiction counselors. So let me take a look. Yeah, I did go through the discussion boards were graded. Um, and what I want to say is, you know, I can really appreciate that students shared a lot of their personal stories within these discussion board posts and why they felt that trauma-informed care was something that was beneficial um, as it pertains to them personally. And I can appreciate all of the honesty and the courage and the willingness to share your own story. So if you have done that um, with a bunch of strangers that you've never met before, really thank you. Um, it contributes to the class in ways that I don't even think everyone, anyone can even acknowledge. Um, and it really really allows people to have a relationship with some of the material. So I really appreciate everyone who has offered that information and shared some things about themselves. Um, but I do hope that, um, and what I've noticed from the discussion board posts is that it does look like people enjoyed this topic, which makes me pretty happy because um, in unit four, as we start to talk about the adverse childhood experiences studies, um, this is where you will see this information tie in a little bit. Um, so let's take a look here at unit three. What I want to do quickly is just pull up the unit three quiz so that I can um, take a look and as promised, provide an answer for you from this quiz as a um, token of my appreciation for you watching the unit video. Um, okay, <clears throat> so let me just make sure, I just, generally what I like to do is I like to take out the, um, the question that people typically have the most difficulty with and provide an answer for that. Okay, so, um, one thing that, that just reminded me, for Unit two, um, the code of ethics is something that you, you should have read and that you should have talked about in your unit assignment. The code of ethics, um, I noticed a lot of people were commenting that the code of ethics was basically, you know, bylaws for the professional to follow when they're working with a, uh, with a, a client. And what I did want to know is that the code of ethics serves in a way of protection for the client, but also it serves as a, a sense of protection for or expectation as well for the clinician too. So I challenge you to look at the code of ethics as something that um, you know benefits both the client as well as the professional. And I know that a number of students um, missed the element of one of the questions where it asked if there is a primary ethical decision-making model for professionals to follow. The answer is no. There is no primary decision-making model as far as ethics goes in the counseling profession. So every situation is different. You know, um, one of the best things that, you know, I, I typically did if I was felt like, if I felt like I was facing an ethical dilemma is I would go and I would seek supervision from my supervisor. Um, of course, meanwhile, also consulting the ACA Code of Ethics, but sometimes it's not... Um, the code of ethics isn't as black and white um, as a situation and be like applicable to a situation that you're experiencing. So um, keeping the ACA code of ethics in mind, it's a very good idea to go and seek um, supervision. And then a lot of, you know, clinical teams will offer um, just that a clinical team. So you have an opportunity to um, meet with your coworkers and other clinicians that you might be working with to get their opinion on the topic and that kind of thing. So keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So for unit three, you are going to, um, read your typical two chapters in this, um, particular unit. You're going to read chapters four and 10 in Helkowski, and then you are going to watch a short video, um, on the art of rehabilitation counseling. Surprise, surprise. You are also going to be watching another TED talk, um, which is by Eleanor Longden, where um, she talks about her experiences with schizophrenia, as well as um, her experiencing her experiences working with clinicians 
who in the moment were treating her for her schizophrenia. So that is a it's a it's it's a very interesting TED talk. Um, and then moving on, you're going to read three um, supplemental articles that are in the unit for you. You're going to submit the unit three assignment, complete quiz two, and then. here okay yep and then um, post the resource list as a discussion board sorry I thought I got the two units mixed up but um, as I had mentioned before about the resource list assignment this is an assignment that creates a little bit of anxiety for students and for good reason so before I get into this let me just go through a question on the quiz. So let's take a look here. This is all pretty easy. So there are two questions that sound kind of similar, although they are very different. So the first question is, which organization oversees rehabilitation counseling programs in regards to standards, standards and accredi accreditation? The other question is, which organization is responsible for overseeing the certification of rehabilitation counselors? So sometimes I get students each semester where they're not entirely sure of what accreditation means. Um, but just to kind of give you a rundown, when UB or any university for that matter has, you know, like a clinical program, um, such as mental health counseling or um, rehabilitation counseling. Those are two clinical programs that UB does offer as a master's program. There has to be an accrediting agency that oversees it to make sure that the university is um, covering all of the things in that program that would make someone competent to be a counselor in one of those professions. So um, for for the overseeing certification of rehabilitation counselors, that's not accreditation. That is just who is the certifying, you know, the overseeing certifying, you know, um, organization. So I am going to give you the answer for the organization, um, which organization oversees rehabilitation counseling programs in regards to standards and accreditation. The answer to this is CARCREP, C-A-C-R-E-P. So, um, they actually not only oversee rehabilitation programs, but they are also responsible for accrediting like mental health counseling programs and that kind of thing. So if you want more interest uh, or if you have any interest in learning more about like what the accrediting uh, process looks like um, or what they oversee, you can actually go to the website. Um, the way that it works is so like when, when a university like first creates a program, um, after some time, they do have the option of being accredited. And they actually have to maintain this accreditation. So every so often, you know, people from this organization will come in and they will do kind of like an audit or like take a look and see, you know, what the program looks like to make sure that the university is maintaining, um, you know, their ability to graduate competent counselors in the field of study or the counseling field of study that they um, are enrolled in. So for that question, that is the answer. So the other thing that I've kind of already started talking about and that I might have already kind of like harped on a little bit is the resource list. So again, if you go into UB Learns and you open up the Projects and Papers tab, you will find um, the resource list. And there is a template already on there for you that lists all of the 11 counseling professions that we are going to talk about in this course. What you are responsible to do is to find an individual who practices as that, that counseling professional in that capacity for each one and you are to provide information on each one. Some students have a hard time locating professionals because they aren't as familiar with the resources available, but if you take a look at psychologytoday.com, there are a number of professionals in that database or in that search engine that um, are on our resource list. So use that as a resource. The other thing is Google. If you just Google, 
um, you know, college counselors um, in the Buffalo, in Buffalo, New York or something like that. It might not come up for college counselors, but um, that's another way to kind of go about and doing, go about and do things. Um, the biggest piece of this assignment is that the individual that you choose, their credentials must absolutely match the credentials that we learn that someone in that profession has to possess in order to be to practice in that capacity. I've said it before, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to say it again, um, especially for um, mental health counselors. So clinical mental health counselors are someone who possesses possesses a license to practice mental health counseling. However, there are individuals from other professions with other credentials who can also practice in the same capacity. What I mean by that? So you have licensed master social workers. These individuals cannot provide private therapy um, outside of an organization. However, if they are a licensed clinical social worker, they do have the ability to practice um, therapy privately. So when you're looking for your mental health counselors, make sure that the professional possesses an LMHC because that is what we learn in this course that that individual must possess in order to practice. So we don't learn about social workers, but we do learn about licensed mental health counselors. So whoever you choose, make sure they have an LMHC. Um, for rehabilitation counseling, they must have a CRC. So they must be a certified rehabilitation counselor. Um, certified rehabilitation counselor, yes. So um, there is a website, CRCC. Um, this will give you the option to look for um, the database for a ton of counselors. So you can type in your zip code and it'll give you a list of individuals who are CRCs in your area. And a lot of ways, uh, it's very possible that they will also provide you with their cell phone numbers um, as well as the other information that you need to fill in that grid. Um, for addictions counselors, you may also see some people listing their credentials as LMHC. For this, you want to make sure that the individual that you use is a certified alcohol and substance abuse counselor, a KSAC. So just make sure that you um, are really just paying attention to what their credentials are and making sure that they match what um, the material in our class supports. So I just gave you like three different credentials that you want to make sure you look for. Um, so that gives you a pretty good start. Um, this resource list, you want to make sure that you are posting in the discussion board in the in the designated area. So I tried to make sure that any indication where like your directive is to submit it in a Dropbox has been deleted. I'm pretty sure I caught it in the syllabus. You do not need to post the resource list in a discussion. I'm, I'm sorry. You do not need to submit the resource list assignment to a Dropbox because there is no Dropbox and I can actually complete the grading right in the discussion board post. So you don't need to worry about that. Post the resource list in the discussion board um, and you should be good to go. And the reason why I, I have you post it in a discussion board and share it with everyone is because um, this is a really good resource for people who need to locate and contact a um, a counseling professional. So if in their resource list, you know, the mental health counselor that they listed isn't available to do an interview or, um, you know, just isn't getting back to them, then they can turn to the class and see, oh, there's 60 something other papers um, or resource lists from other students that I can maybe go back and look and take a look at um, who they listed um, as a mental health counselor. And I can go ahead and contact this person. So it's meant to kind of be like a sharing tool. With that being said, Please do not copy um, anyone else's resource list because we do have safe assign and it will let me know um, what percentage of a match there is to everyone else's paper. So I understand that it's very possible that more than one student is going to list the same professional for a particular profession. Just make sure you're not copying someone else's resource list. That's all. Um, I think that is pretty much it. We're going to learn about rehabilitation counselors and career counselors in this unit. Um, I myself am a certified rehabilitation counselor, so if you have any questions regarding this profession, please let me know. Uh, this is a pretty broad counseling professional, um, and UB does offer a master's program for this particular profession. Generally, uh, rehabilitation counselors, like I mentioned, can practice in 
a number of roles or capacities. A lot of them become, you know, vocational experts. So if there is an individual who, you know, was working a job that they really, really loved and they happened to get injured on the job and due to their injury, they were no longer able to perform that job once it was time for them to come back to work. A rehabilitation counselor would assist them by um, exploring other options. So maybe it's giving them assessments to see what other interests or other jobs they would be interested in doing um, or, you know, offering and really hooking them up with services that would benefit them to help them be successful in their career. Um, rehabilitation counselors can also serve in the capacity of addictions. Uh, you know, I did my, an internship of mine in a methadone clinic and I was being supervised and working along with a number of other CRCs. So there's a, there's a number of things that one can do with their, um, with their CRC. And there is, so I'm not sure if anyone's heard of Access VR. Um, this is a state program that, um, often employs a number of CRCs. So I'm not sure if that's in your material um, this week, but that's something that you might learn about. And then career counselors, um, essentially um, just helping people identify, you know, what interests they have, what careers would be good for them. You know, a lot of career counselors are in universities uh, in the counseling centers and that kind of thing. One thing I do want to mention about the rehabilitation counselors is I did notice from other semesters that students will list a rehabilitation counselor and then under duties um, talk about how rehabilitation counselors will um, essentially serve as a physical therapist and help them, you know, rehabilitate them back to health. If you put this on your resource list, you are going to get docked a lot of points. Um, there is nothing in our material that talks about rehabilitation counselors in a medical capacity to where they would be assisting or nursing someone back to physical health. So please keep in mind that that is not what a rehabilitation counselor does. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I think overall, that's pretty much it. Um, I just want to make sure that now that we're completing our resource lists, if you have an individual in mind that you would like to interview for your um, interview of a counseling professional paper, I would really recommend reaching out now. Um, and I should actually say that for everyone. You should really be reaching out to the counselor that you have interest in um, interviewing right like as soon as the, the resource lists are done. Um, whether you know you can go on to and take a look at people who submitted theirs early or if you want to just contact people that you found on your own because things are going to start to get really hectic. Um, you know, people are going to be interviewing for internships, internships in the fall. People are going to be wrapping up their internships. You know, the weather's getting nicer. Spring break is coming up. People are going to, you know, not have a ton of time as they're going out and going on vacation. So if you um, can, please, please, please start contacting your professionals like now. Um, I did get an email a year or two ago where uh, the counseling center at UD had asked me to stop referring students to them for interviews. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, if you can interview a college counselor or, um, you know, a career counselor somewhere else, please, please attempt to do that. Um, but other than that, I think that's everything. I know that I've been saying a lot in my announcements that I've been making, um, and I've pretty much talked your ear off here. So if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and good luck.